a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. I've come here today for the next part, and today is uh, the 15th of October 2017, uh, for the next part in the reading of um, that paper that leads up to the reading of the book from Martin Luther, which is called Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution by the Devil. And um, this little paper is called Martin Luther's View on the Antichrist. We have uh, last time finished on page 15, and I'm going to now continue there on, uh, with the next subject called Negating Christ's Sacrifice. And I think this will be the last inaugural reading. After that, I can start reading the book from Martin Luther to you, my English brethren, that I already did read completely in German to my German brethren. And, uh, of course, with that, the month of October is completely filled with videos only dealing with quote-unquote Reformation, as I told you that I think the Reformation is really not to reform the Roman Catholic Church, but to reform the faith of the people out of the Roman Catholic Church back to real apostolic biblical Christianity. And... Um, this month of October is very important, not only because it is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, but it is a very important anyway, like every anniversary of the Reformation Day is important, and please do not celebrate Halloween, celebrate Reformation Day. Think of Jesus Christ and not of ghouls and demons and monsters and this stuff on that day and neither on any other day. If I can at least convince you of that, not to follow these Roman Catholic feast days. So this month of October has been in my channel, Juggler 66, absolutely 100% dedicated for the Reformation, for Protestantism and for the true Word of God that found the way out of the Roman Catholic Church 500 years ago, at least in Germany, and set almost all of Germany in the next years free because Martin Luther translated the Bible on the Wartburg in German. And by that also started the high German, <coughs> normal German language as we call it today, because that didn't exist before. Anyway, no further introduction. I'm just going to start the reading, otherwise I'm going to have to make another part. <laughs> I really want to finish this paper today. Negating Christ's sacrifice is this next uh, little part of the paper called. Not only did the Roman Antichrist usurp God's prerogatives and persecute his people, according to Luther, but he in effect negated Christ's sacrifice and mediation. Quote, Antichrist abolishes grace and denies the blessings of Christ, our high priest, who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Unquote. He said, one way he did this was through the doctrine of merit, said Luther, the noxious notion of our own righteousness, was why we could not at all see Christ as the mediator and saviour, but simply supposed that he was a severe judge, who had to be placated by our works. This was to blaspheme Christ to the utmost, and to nullify the grace of God to make Christ die to no purpose. And this is the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as we can read in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. The doctrine that monks could justify themselves by, quote, their hypocritical sanctity, even though it is the proper function of Christ alone to justify the sinner, unquote, had, he said, 
quote, denied and completely suppressed the work of Christ and his divinity, unquote. The blasphemy on the forehead of the scarlet whore he interpreted to be the manifold innumerable self-chosen works or forms of worship which were presented as sacrifices in order to suppress Christ's sacrifice. Uh, that's a very important sentence. Huh? The manifold innumerable self-chosen works or forms of worship which were presented as sacrifices in order to suppress Christ's sacrifice. You know, by following the Roman Catholic tradition and Roman Catholic, um, how do you say that, the sacraments, um, you make Christ's sacrifice to no avail. You deny actually that Jesus Christ was the once and for all sacrifice. You deny when you partake in the sacraments of the holy of the quote unquote holy Roman Catholic Church, you deny that Jesus Christ was the perfect Lamb. That Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. The manifold innumerable self chosen works means all the sacraments and all the works done in the Roman Catholic Church or other forms of worship are as sacrifices in order to suppress Christ's sacrifice. Well, that's normal because the Roman Catholic Church does not, leave and does, not, does not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Therefore, the Jesus of the Bible failed. And you heard Pope Francis say that, I think it was even this year, 2017, that Pope Francis said the failure of the cross of Jesus Christ. How can a Christian ever say that Jesus failed on the cross? Right, the Pope is no Christian. You got that right. Now Luther declared, quote, The chief article of the Christian doctrine is that Christ is our righteousness. He who is now attacking this is taking the whole Christ away and is the true Antichrist, unquote. Now Martin Luther really understood who the Antichrist was. That the Pope, the office of the papacy, from the beginning has been, is at his time, and was for always in the future, even from now into all future, until Jesus Christ come, comes back, the Antichrist of the Bible. The biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is the papacy, denying Christ's work on the cross. Luther said the papacy also negated Christ's sacrifice by proclaiming the Mass to be, quote, a sacrifice for the living and the dead. Now let me just stop here. The Mass is, according to the Roman Catholic Church, a sacrifice for the living and the dead. Now, the only time that I can remember when in the Bible it speaks about worshipping dead people, God said in one of the first books of Moses, don't do it. That is necromancy. And when one of the disciples wanted to follow Jesus Christ, he asked, let me first bur uh, bury my father. And Jesus Christ answered, let the dead bury the dead. The God of the living, Jesus Christ and the Creator God and the Creator Father of Heaven have nothing to do with the dead. And they don't approve of anything like praying to the dead. Jesus does not and the Father in Heaven does not. So when we follow Him, we cannot partake in a quote-unquote sacrifice for the living and the dead. That is necromancy. The Mass in itself is pagan. In the Bible there is only the Holy Communion. When Jesus said, break this bread and do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus said, take this wine, drink this blood and do this in remembrance of me. That's biblical. The sacrament of the Mass is no sacrament. It is a sacrilege, but even that is <laughs> a Roman Catholic word. So, 
It's an abomination. That is the true word, the biblical word to reject the Roman Catholic Mass. A sacrifice for the living and the dead. Lighting candles. You know, in the Bible, there are never candles lighted, but oil lamps. Big difference, huh? A sacrifice for the living and the dead is what Luther said that uh, also by this the uh, papacy negated Christ's sacrifice by proclaiming the mass to be a sacrifice for the living and the dead, obtaining forgiveness of sins. Now what does have a uh, celebrating a mass to do with obtaining forgiveness of sins? Sins can only be forgiven when we pray to Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ to our Father in Heaven. Only He can forgive sins. No man, no priest, no cardinal, bishop or pope of Rome. It is as though Christ had not done this very thing on the cross, as though His sacrifice had no validity and were of no value. Well, yeah, here we come again to the failure of the cross. Huh? It's just the same thing, what Pope Francis said this year. Jesus failed at the cross. It is as though Christ had not done this very thing on the cross, as though his sacrifice had no validity and were of no value. That's why the Pope can say, Jesus Christ failed at the cross. Now, Luther suggested that these daily repeated sacrifices, because that's what a Mass is, that that is what this transubstantiation is, it is a sacrifice, where counterfeiting Christ, Luther said, and purporting to do, quote, that which Christ alone, by his sacrifice, once for all effected, unquote. Bravo! That is true truly biblical spoken. Jesus Christ was the one who alone by his sacrifice once and for all took away the sins of the world. That's what he said. That's why he said it is done. It is finished. What is finished? The law. The sacrificial law is finished. No more sacrifice. The Roman Catholic Church is all about sacrificing. So the Roman Catholic Church is all about denying Jesus Christ. And what does the Bible say? He who denies Jesus Christ is an antichrist. Do we need more proof? (laughs) No, after this I don't think so, and surely not when I'm done with reading the book that is upcoming. Now, Luther insisted that Christ was still our only mediator, and I insist on that too. But the Pope, of course, says otherwise. What does the Pope say? (laughs) You need the Church, or you even need Mary. When you want to go to the Father, you have to accept the Mother, and that is the Church too. Now, here comes a quote of Martin Luther again. Christ and the Scriptures know nothing of the priestly system set up by the papacy. Jesus had not abdicated his high priestly office, nor had he transferred it to the Pope. God preserve us from having any other priest but Christ, unquote, Martin Luther said. God preserve us from having any other priest but Christ. Yeah. No manly priest, no man priest that we go to for the forgiveness of our sins or that we go to even to confess our sins. Because then we take away the glory of Jesus Christ. God preserve us from having any other priest but Christ. Biblically, And Luther goes into extensively into that in this paper from 1520 on the Christian nobility and also in the Babylonian captivity. You can read that for yourself. It is that way that we are all brethren, we are all priests, and we have one head, and that is Jesus Christ. And the Roman Catholic Church says, no, 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 no. You are all lay people, and then you have the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, and me on top, and I am God on earth. 
Well, if you want to believe that, no problem, then you're going to believe that. But don't come to me and say that you believe in biblical doctrine, because you don't. God preserve us from having any other priest but Christ, Martin Luther said. And I applaud him for that. He is so true. We have one priest. We have one mediator. It is stated in the Bible, there is no other name under heaven given unto man by which you must be saved. The name Christ Jesus. Right? Continue reading. Another way we nullify Christ's coming in the flesh, according to Luther, is by calling upon Mary or the other saints. <laughs> in the whole Bible, you can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find one verse venerating Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, the biological mother of Jesus Christ. But you will find in Jeremiah, chapter 44, mentioning of giving homage to the Queen of Heaven. And that's the problem. The Roman Catholic Church just baptized its pagan traditions with Christianity. And by that, their Queen of Heaven, under the name of Persephone, under the name of Ishtar, under the name of Semiramis, whatever name you want to call them. Go to Alexander Hislops, the two Babylons, and you will find many, many names for that Queen of Heaven. That Queen of Heaven became Mary. It is only done, or it was only done in the time, so that the heathen would accept Christianity as their new religion. So they could keep their worshipping idols and gods and goddesses just with another name. Now all of a sudden their Queen of Heaven was called Mary. Well, the heathen don't care, but the Christians should care when anybody says that you have to venerate Mary, the biological mother of Jesus Christ, for which there is between Genesis and Revelation not one verse written in the Bible. The invocation of the saints is one of the abuses of the Antichrist, Martin Luther said. Now we are dealing a little bit with eschatology. Luther believed that the Bible foretold the church's future and suggested that the time of judgment predicted in Daniel 7 verses 8 and 9 was taking place during his lifetime affirming that his own teachings were those of, quote, the ancient and true church at the time of the apostles, unquote, he thought the little horn was being judged as the original and ancient church, shown forth once more like the sun emerging from the clouds behind which it had been shining, but where it could not be seen. He found comfort in the prophecies that the last days would be shortened for the sake of the godly, and that the church would be preserved and Antichrist would not encompass everything with error and falsehood. He noted that in the second angel's message of Revelation 14, the gospel was followed by a voice predicting that Babylon, the spiritual papacy, would be destroyed. This would be done, according to other passages, without human hands, with the breath of Christ's mouth, slaying him with spiritual preaching, before destroying him by his glorious and sudden coming, which would free Christendom from every evil. At that time, those who cling to the papacy against the gospel shall be cast outside the city of Christ into the winepress of God's wrath. Now, did I read anything of a secret rapture? <laughs> I guess not. And do you know why? Because the teaching of the rapture and the teaching of a quote-unquote seven-year tribulation only came at the end of the 16th century that Luther lived in. While Luther was living, there was even not from the Roman Catholic Church a dogma 
of a futurist or preterist antichrist that were just the answers the Roman Catholic Church gave and with their denial of Jesus Christ fulfilling Daniel's 70th week they invented the rapture and that is why Martin Luther does not speak about any rapture because that's a word that he probably didn't even know that wasn't invented at that time there is no rapture as there is no seven year tribulation well there is no seven year tribulation I say there is no biblical seven year tribulation let me say it that way because of course the antichrist system will take care of that there will be a kind of a seven year tribulation here on earth because they need that to fulfill their phony 70th week of Daniel but every Christian should be aware of that this tribulation that is happening does not uh, is not being preceded by a rapture not with in the middle of the tribulation there will be no rapture and after the tribulation there will be no rapture there is no rapture there is only the resurrection at the second coming of Jesus Christ and that's why Luther says Christendom um, that uh, uh, this would be done according to other passages without human hands you know this is like the stone that is not hewn out with hands from the mountain that crushes the statue of Daniel 2 in the feet uh, without human hands with the breath of Christ's mouth as in another part I think it is in 2 Thessalonians 2 that we read that Christ with the, with the power of his mouth will uh, overcome the Antichrist slaying him with spiritual preaching before destroying him by his glorious and sudden coming as we can read in 2 Thessalonians 2 which would free Christendom from every evil at that time Martin Luther says those who cling to the papacy against the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast outside the city of Christ into the winepress of God's wrath there is no rapture. Now coming to the end of the paper we are speaking about Luther's final years. The, intens uh, the intensity of Luther's attacks on the papacy increased during 1545, the final year of his life. As Will Durant puts it, quote, Luther's temper became hot lava as he neared the grave, unquote. That year, 1545, in his preface to a compilation of his complete works, he described the Pope not only as Antichrist, but also as the devil's vicar. The Pope calls himself Vicarius Fili Dei, that stands for the vicar, the replacement of God on earth and the Pope is right he is the vicar of God on earth but he is the vicar of the God of this earth as we can read in the New Testament which is the prince of the air which is Satan and by that Martin, Lu Martin Luther nails it when he says he is not only Antichrist but he is also the devil's vicar. You always have to make sure that you understand which God they speak about. When the Roman Catholic Church speaks of God, it does not speak of the true Creator God, but it speaks of their God, which is Satan. And the Pope is the vicar of Satan on earth. His last and most bitter attack on the Pope was called Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. That book that I am reading, which will be the next video I upload probably after this one in the English language. Written at the request of Elector John Frederick, it was a response to two letters from Antichrist Pope Paul III 
forbidding the emperor from calling a free German National Council to settle the religious disputes within the empire. Now, isn't this interesting information? The last book that Luther wrote, and he published that on the 25th of March 1545, which is the same day the Council of Trent opened, was written at the request of Elector John Frederick. It was a response to two letters from Pope Paul III forbidding the Emperor from calling a free German National Council to settle the religious disputes within the Empire. Three times in this publication Luther referred to the Pope as, quote, the most hellish father, unquote, instead of the most holy father, as he would like to be called. He denounced him as a teacher of lies, blasphemies and idolatries, a murderer of kings, an inciter to all kinds of bloodshed, and a brothel keeper above all brothel keepers and all vermin, and even a true werewolf. Were such attacks unchristian? Well, <laughs> Luther didn't think so, and I surely do not think so. Earlier, he had said it was not sin to refute Satan's reviling against godliness and God himself. They must, he said, be exposed and refuted, so the people could be corrected and liberated from the tyranny of Satan. Similarly, Luther said, quote, We are attacking the Pope as the Antichrist and seducer of the whole world. We are incited to anger against him not by personal ambition, but by righteous jealousy and fervor of conscience to vindicate and protect the glory of God. Unquote. Now, isn't this an important sentence? In one of my earlier readings, I said that I don't hate the Pope. By that I mean the man that is behind that office. I hate the office of the Pope. I hate the office of the Antichrist, of course, as I hate Satan. But we are to love the people who hate and persecute us, according to Jesus Christ. Why? because the man is just obsessed from a wrong, devilish spirit. And that is why Martin Luther also says here, and I'm going to repeat this little quote again, We are attacking the Pope as the Antichrist and seducer of the whole world. We are incited to anger against him, not by personal ambition, not by personal ambition, but by righteous jealousy and fervor, of conscience to vindicate and protect the glory of God. Personal ambition. Not by personal ambition. That is, don't hate the man, but hate his deeds. Hate the office that he represents, but not the man itself. We are to love all men. Even the lost. Paul's attacks on the false apostles were not slander. He was judging them by his apostolic authority. Likewise, when Luther called the Pope Antichrist, he said he was, quote, judging by divine authority. On the basis of Galatians 1, verse 8, quote, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, isn't there this saying, judge not so that you will not be judged? In another place in the Bible it is said, why don't you judge? Because you even go and, uh, and judging angels. So uh, you can judge the reprobates within your own community, right? It's stated in the Bible. We have to judge, as it says here, 
that though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So that means that we have the right to accurse the Pope because he preaches another gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of the true Bible. As long as the Roman Catholic Church does not preach the true living Creator God of heaven and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, we are to accurse them. That's what even stands in the Bible. Galatians 1 verse 8. Read it for yourself. Not judging? Well, I am judging by divine authority, as Martin Luther calls it. And I absolutely agree. It can be argued, however, that although Luther was anti-papal, he was not anti-Catholic. No, of course he was not anti-Catholic. I, I even dare to say that he stayed a Catholic in his heart for the, all his life. That's why he wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. He did not see that it really was the synagogue of Satan and was irreformable. But he was not anti-Catholic. He was anti-Catholic doctrine, but he was not anti-Catholic. Because if he, or I for example, would be anti-Catholic, I would be anti-every Catholic person. I am not against the Catholic persons. I hope that they finally will read Revelation 18 verse 4 and come out of her as God calls them to come out of there. The point is, and that's also the point the author makes here, and uh, that is made about Luther, that he was not anti-Catholic. No, he can't be anti-Catholic, you can't be anti all the people who are in the Catholic Church, but you have to be anti the Roman Catholic hierarchy, their superstition, their idolatry, and all that you have to be against but not against the normal Catholic people. It continues to say he opposed the dictatorial monarchical episcopate at the head of the church, not the church itself. As Jaroslav Pelikan puts it, quote, Although the Pope was the Antichrist, seated in the temple of God, the church in which he was seated was still the temple of God. Unquote. Now, we today are 500 years smarter than Martin Luther was. And we know that that church is not the temple of God anymore, but it was until the time it was hijacked in 321. It was the true church before, and then it was hijacked and kidnapped by Rome. And in that temple, of course, in that temple of God, the Pope sits. That's why the Bible says that he will sit in the temple of God and uh, proclaiming himself to be God. That's absolutely true. So although the Pope was the Antichrist seated in the temple of God, the church in which he was seated was still the temple of God, because it was filled with people who believed righteously in the Creator God of the Bible. But they follow not the belief of the Bible, as God commands, but they follow the tradition and the teaching of man. But therefore it was still as they say here, the temple of God. Well, today, a few years later, I do not agree with that anymore, that the Roman Catholic Church is the temple of God. The temple of God or the body of Christ are the true believers who are the remnant here on the earth. Now let's have a look at other reformers. By the time of Luther's death, other voices had joined him in the proclaiming that the Pope was the Antichrist, including both his friends and disciple Philip Melanchthon, and a man for whom he had little respect, Ulrich Zwingli, who was a Swiss reformer under John Calvin also. Other contemporaries of Luther who shared his belief about the papal Antichrist included John Calvin, John Knox and Thomas Cranmer. Among the later reformers who held this view were the Anabaptist Menno Simons and various Huguenot theologians. Even King James I of England got into the act, writing an exposition of the book of Revelation that called Rome the seat of the Antichrist and a second Babylon. Now, this is 
where I have to go a little bit astray today. Because I just almost couldn't believe it when I read this for the very first time. What does it say here? Let me repeat this that we can get this straight. It says, King James I of England, who we owe the King James Bible to, got into the act writing an exposition of the book of Revelation that called Rome the seat of the Antichrist and a second Babylon. So, therefore, I have this um, excerpt that I have here on the internet right now, and I'm going to read to you, because this is uh, articles of Christian doctrine which were to have been presented on our part to the Council, if any had been assembled at Mantua or elsewhere, indicating that we would accept or yield and what we could not. It's about the small cult articles from Project Wittenberg, Martin Luther in 1537, published in Triglot Concordia, the symbolical books of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. The second part, Article 4 of the Papacy that the Pope is not, according to divine law or according to the word of God, the head of all Christendom, for this name belongs to one only, whose name is Jesus Christ, but is only the bishop and pastor of the church at Rome, and of those who voluntarily or through a human creature, that is a political magistrate, have attached themselves to him, to be Christians not under him as a lord, but with him as brethren, colleagues and comrades, as the ancient councils of the age and the age of St. Cyprian show. But today none of the bishops dare to address the Pope as brother as was done at the time in the age of Cyprian, but they must call him most gracious lord, even though they be kings or emperors. This arrogance we will not, cannot, must not take upon our conscience with a good conscience approve. Let him, however, who will do it, do so without us at his own risk. Hence it follows that all things which the Pope from a power so false, mischievous, blasphemous and arrogant has done and undertaken have been and still are purely diabolical affairs and transactions with the exception of such things as pertain to the secular government where God often permits much good to be effected for the people, even through a tyrant and faithless scoundrel, for the ruin of the entire holy Catholic or Christian Church so far as it is in his power, and for the destruction of the first and chief article concerning the redemption made through Jesus Christ. For all his bulls and books are extant, in which he roars like a lion, as the re angel in Revelation 12 depicts him, crying out that no Christian can be saved unless he obeys him, and is subject to him in all things that he wishes, that he says, and that he does. All of which amounts to nothing less than saying, quote, Although you believe in Christ and have him alone everything that is necessary to salvation, yet it is nothing and all in vain unless you regard, have and worship me, the Pope, as your God, and be subject and obedient to me. And yet it is manifest that the Holy Church has been without the Pope for at least more than 500 years, and that even to the present day the churches of the Greeks and of many other languages neither have been nor are yet under the Pope. Besides, as often remarked, it is a human figment which is not commanded and is unnecessary and useless, for the holy Christian or Catholic Church can exist very well without such a head, and it would certainly have remained better, purer, and its career would have been more prosperous if such a head had not been raised up by the devil. And the papacy is also of no use in the Church, because it exercises no Christian office, and therefore it is necessary for the Church to continue and to exist without the Pope. Now let me just explain for a second why am I reading this, because I will continue reading this in a, uh, in a, in a moment. The point is, 
um, that I just read to you, even King James I of England got into the act writing an exposition of the book of Revelation that called Rome the seat of the Antichrist and the second Babylon. I would really very much like to get my hands on that paper that is mentioned in Froome's book on page 537 and 540. I could not find that. But the article here continues to read, many of the foundational creeds of Protestantism, including the formula of Concord, and that is what I am reading from now, the formula of Concord, as I uh, read here in the beginning. This is Trigolet Concordia, the symbolic books of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, a writing by Martin Luther in 1537 that I started reading, and I just will continue to read that in a second. Many of the foundational creeds of Protestantism, including the formula of Concord, what we are just reading here, the Second Scottish Confession, the Westminster Confession, the Savoy Declaration and the Congressional Churches and the Baptist Confession of 1688 echoed all Luther's belief on this subject. And that's why I'm going to continue for a moment reading this uh, not too long article that is taken out of the uh, small called articles, the Formula of Concord. So I'm going to continue reading this now. And, um, yeah, okay, I had to check my, uh, my recorder is still running. It is, okay. Um, and supposing that the Pope would yield this point so as to not be supreme by divine right or from God's command, but that we must have, there must be elected a certain head to whom all the rest adhere as their, support, as their support in order that the concord and unity of Christians may be preserved against sects and heretics, that such a head were chosen by men and that it were placed within the choice and power of men to change or remove this head just as the Council of Constance adopted nearly this course with reverence to the popes deposing three and electing a fourth. Supposing, I say, that the Pope and see at Rome would yield and accept this, which nevertheless is impossible, for thus he would have to suffer his entire realm and estate to be overthrown and destroyed with all his rights and books, a thing which, to speak in few words, he cannot do. Nevertheless, even in this way Christianity would not be helped but many more sects would arise than before. A very little interesting sentence was this here, because I read in the beginning, understand this please, Christians may be preserved against sects and heretics that such a head were chosen by men, and that it were placed within the choice and power of men to change or remove this head. And the papacy is not that kind of a hat. The papacy is chosen by a curia that no normal man elected. Yeah? It's like in the so-called democracy where people think that they choose their political leaders, but they are chosen by parties, not by the people themselves. And so Martin Luther says here, within the choice and power of men to change or remove this head, the papacy, just as the Council of Constance did. And the Council of Constance in 1514, three popes were abolished, were deposed of, and a fourth was elected. Probably something you didn't know, but also we go into that a little bit more when we read Luther's upcoming book. For since men would have to be subject to this head, not from God's command, but from their personal good pleasure, it would easily and in a short time be despised, and at last retain no member. Neither would it have to be forever confined to Rome or any other place, but it might be, but it might be wherever and in whatever church God would uh, grant ma a man fit for the taking upon him such a great office. Oh, the complicated and confused state of affairs or the perplexity that would result. Therefore, the church can never be better governed and preserved than if it all live under one head, Christ, and all the bishops equal in office, 
although there be unequal in gifts, be diligently joined in unity of doctrine, in unity of faith, sacraments, prayer, and works of love, etc., as St. Jerome writes that the priests of Alexandria together and in common governed the churches, as did also the apostles, and afterward all bishops throughout all Christendom, until the Pope raised his head above all. Until the Pope raised his head above all. Until in 606, Emperor Phocas made the Pope the leader of the Western and the Eastern spiritual world. And the Pope raised his head as the Bishop of Rome above all other bishops. This teaching shows forcefully that the Pope is the very Antichrist, who has exalted himself above and deposed himself against Christ because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which nevertheless is nothing and is neither ordained nor commanded by God. This is, properly speaking, to exalt himself above all that is called God, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, even the Turks or the Tatars, great enemies of Christians as they are, do not do this. But they allow whoever wishes to believe in Christ and take bodily tribute and obedience from Christians. <laughs> now, Luther says, even the Turks or the Tartars do not do this. They do not exalt themselves above all that is called God. Therefore, my dear listening brethren, the Antichrist cannot be somebody from or out of Islam. But it has to be the papacy. The Pope, however, prohibits this faith, saying that to be saved a person must obey Him. Well, the Bible says when you want to be saved you have to obey Jesus Christ. And the Pope says no, you have to obey Him. Because, he says, He is Jesus Christ, I guess. <laughs> this we are unwilling to do, even though on this account we must die in God's name. Very important sentence of Martin Luther. I'm going to repeat this first two sentences here. The Pope, however, prohibits this faith, saying that to be saved a person must obey him. This we are unwilling to do, even though on this account we must die in God's name. This all proceeds from the fact that the Pope has wished to be called the supreme head of the Christian Church by divine right. Accordingly, he had to make himself equal and superior to Christ, and had to cause himself to be proclaimed the head and then the Lord of the Church, and finally the Lord of the whole world, and simply God on earth, until he has dared to issue commands even to the angels in heaven. And when we distinguish the Pope's teaching from, or measure and hold it against Holy Scripture, it is found, it appears plainly, that the, Pope is teach, that the Pope's teaching, where it is best, has been taken from the imperial and heathen law, pagan law, and treats of political matters and decisions or rights, as the decretals show, furthermore it teaches of ceremonies concerning churches, garments, food, persons and similar puerile, theatrical and comical things without measure. But in all these things nothing at all of Christ, nothing at all of faith and the commandments of God. Lastly, it is nothing else than the devil himself, because above and against God he urges and disseminates his papal falsehoods concerning masses, purgatory, the monastic life, one's own works, and fictitious divine worship, for this is the very papacy upon each of which the papacy is altogether founded and is standing, and condemns, murders, and tortures all Christians who do not exalt and honor these abominations of the Pope above all things. 
Therefore, just as little as we can, wor uh, just as little as we can worship the devil himself as Lord and God, we can endure his apostle, the Pope, or Antichrist, in his rule as head of Lord. For to lie and to kill and to destroy body and soul eternally, that is wherein his papal government really consists, as I have very clearly shown in many books. In these four articles, they will have enough to condemn in the Council, for they cannot and will not concede us even the least point in one of these articles. Of this we should be certain, and animate ourselves with the fore, uh, be forewarned and made firm in the hope that Christ our Lord has attacked his adversary, and he will press the attack home, pursue and destroy him, both by his spirit and coming. Amen. For in the council we will stand not before the emperor or the political magistrate as at Augsburg, where the emperor published a most gracious edict and caused matters to be heard kindly and dispassionately. But we will appear before the pope and devil himself, who intends to listen to nothing, but merely, when the case has been publicly announced, to condemn, to murder, and to force us to idolatry. Therefore, we ought not here to kiss his feet, or to say, Thou art my gracious Lord, but as the angel in Zechariah 3, 2 said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. And this is the end of the small cult article that I wanted to read from you from Martin Luther. It is not... Maybe that you expected the writing of King James. I don't have that, but I would very much like to get my hands on that. So if anybody can do some research on that and find that book or that writing of uh, King James the First of England, as it is stated here in this paper, writing an exposition of the book of Revelation that called Rome the seat of Antichrist and the second Babylon, I would really very much like to get that. And you can find that probably in the book of Froom. Uh, it, says, it says here Froom 2, 537-540. So probably the pages of 537 or 540, but I don't know what book of Froom that was, and I don't have that book. But, you know, if anybody has that, I would be glad to receive it anywhere, anytime, and... Uh, of course, I would very much like to read it, because that's just another point, that the King James Bible is the only true Bible, and King James was not a Catholic. And even if he was, he was not, but even if he was, he did not translate the Bible, but a committee of 45 righteous men. Now we come to the conclusion. Luther's conflict with church authorities over the financial exploitation of his parishioners you know, the indulgences, through indulgences led to papal attempts to silence the independent-minded monk. He first began to suspect that the papacy was the Antichrist when its representatives resorted to power plays rather than appealing to scripture, supported the execution of dissidents, and long before it became official dogma, claimed papal infallibility. Long before it became official dogma, you know, official dogma of papal infallibility was claimed at Vatican Council I in 1870 by Pope Pius IX, but long before that already the popes or the Roman Catholic Church in the person of the Pope claimed infallibility. He became sure of his position when the Pope himself threatened Luther with excommunication pressured rulers to silence him and ordered the extermination of him and his followers. But Luther's Antichrist theology was the result of biblical analysis as well as personal experience. The key theological reason for Luther's position was his belief that the Pope was in many ways usurping God's place and negating Christ's sacrifice. A very important sentence this was. Luther's Antichrist theology was the result of biblical analysis as well as personal experience. 
I find this a very, very important sentence. You know, because it was, as it says here, the result of biblical analysis. That the papacy is the Antichrist is proven by Scripture, by the Word of God itself. Daniel, Paul and John were the testimonies of it. Daniel chapter 2 and especially chapter 7. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 and John the Revelator in Revelation 13 and 17 and 18. All pointing biblically in a biblical analysis to the papacy being the Antichrist. It is not Jörg who says the Pope is the Antichrist. It is not just Luther who says the Pope is the Antichrist or any other of uh, the other reformers that are mentioned here, like John Calvin, John Knox, Thomas Cranmer, Ulrich Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, and uh, Henry Gretton Guinness, and James Edgar Wiley, and Charles Spurgeon, and so many other re reformer or protestant writers that all accounted the office of the Antichrist to the papacy. It is because it is based on biblical analysis and therefore it is absolutely necessary to be in possession of the only right true Bible that also gives you this explanation. When you read these forged Bibles, these corrupt Bibles like the NIV and New Living Translation and NASV and RSV and ESV and NLT and I don't know all the names but count them all, more than a few hundred Bibles probably, you will not have the same understanding because those Bibles are written to hide the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist. And the first of these Bibles who, uh, who, hide, who hit that fact was the Schofield Reference Bible. Anyway, Luther's Antichrist theology was the result of biblical analysis. This is what we really have to take home from this reading here. Clearly, it says, Luther's position on the Antichrist is no longer politically correct. <laughs> It was not politically correct in Luther's time. It is not politically correct in our time. It will not be co politically correct in any time because it is not politically correct to speak the truth. It is out of sync with the groupthink of the 21st century. As Heiko Obermann says, quote, Luther's way of speaking about the Antichrist has become alien to us. <laughs> That's a nice quote, yeah. Luther's way of speaking about the Antichrist has become alien to us. Do you know what Luther said? You are not only responsible for what you say, but you are also responsible for what you do not say. So you are responsible for when you are a Bible-believing Christian, and you know from the Bible that the papacy has the Antichrist, and you do not speak out, you are responsible for that, and you will be held responsible for that before the judge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Politically correct? My behind. There is no political correctness. Because political correctness is serving this world. We are not to serve this world. We are to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. And not the Antichrist. Luther's way of speaking about the Antichrist has become alien to us. It should, come our second na it should become our second nature. Luther said, peace if possible, the truth at all cost. I want peace with Roman Catholics. I want peace with the Pope. But I want the truth at all cost. And I don't want any peace with the Antichrist or any unity with the Antichrist or ecumenical meaning or any church for that matter if it compromises on the truth, on the true word of God, on the 1611 King James Bible. Then not for me. Then I say with Luther's words, peace if possible, but the truth at all costs. And all costs include my life here on earth. However, the article continues, 
with so great a cloud of witnesses, as we can read in Hebrews 12, verse 1, stretching back so many centuries, he co who courageously asserted that the papacy was the Antichrist, the question for us should not be, is this position embarrassing, or is it politically correct, or socially acceptable? Rather it should be, is it biblically correct? This view was not politically correct in Luther's day. It was very incorrect politically. And in Luther's day, unlike ours, this opinion could have been literally fatal for the person holding it, as it was for John Huss and Thomas Cranmer. And with this, I end the reading of this paper that is called Martin Luther's view, or Martin Luther's views on the Antichrist. That was the introduction to me reading the book that we can find in Luther's works, volume 41, Church and Ministry. Luther's book, his legacy, I'd like to call it, the last book he ever wrote against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. You will find these readings all leading up to that reading and the book reading itself in the playlist Luther 2017, a playlist that I started I think even last year when I was analyzing a paper on Luther and uh, did that reading. I had no idea that this playlist would ever grow out that much. But in that playlist you will find all the videos of the book reading against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for commenting. And until next time, Jogna66 from Our the Truth signing off says God bless you and bye bye. Oh